As of August 13th, yesterday, there were 21 million people, or nearly 21 million people, who have COVID-19 across the, 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 the country, I mean, the, uh, the world, and about three quarter of a million deaths. Uh, these are just staggering number, uh, just to think about. <laughs> In the United States, we have 5.3 million infections and more than 167,000 deaths. There are actually papers that argue that we're already over 200,000 deaths because of the way we're misclassifying COVID-related deaths. When I last gave this briefing, I was actually very shocked and dismay that the number of infections in the United States had increased by 50% over the preceding three weeks. Well, in the five weeks since that briefing, the number of infections in the United States has gone from 3.1 million to 5.3 million for an increase of 66%. Okay, in the first 14 weeks of the pandemic, when we thought things were going really badly, there were 2 million infections. In the last eight weeks, we have 3.3 million infections. Uh, California, Florida, and Texas have all passed the 500,000 case threshold. California is almost at 600,000. The only slight bit of optimism is that the trend in the number of new cases have been decreasing in a quite a few of the states. However, to balance that optimism, as we would expect, because deaths usually lag behind new cases, the trend line for the last two weeks showed an 11.6% increase in deaths nationally from COVID. A report that just came out this morning from the CDC looked at 79 counties in the United States identify as hotspots for the pandemic in the first two weeks of June. The first thing about that report that was shocking is there were actually 205 counties that were hotspots in 33 states covering 93 million Americans. However, only 79 counties or 39% of them had adequate race data. In other words, they couldn't analyze the other ones for racial and ethnic disparities. I think that's an indictment of our government, our public health and our healthcare system that we can't even collect data on our people. 76 of the, count, of, the, of the 79 counties that actually had adequate race data, 76 of those counties had racial ethnic disparities. 59 of them reporting disparities from Latinx, 22 for Black Americans, 19 for Pacific Islanders, four for Asian Americans, and three for Indigenous people. So the disparities issues that we've seen early on uh, uh, in the pandemic has persisted. Uh, no matter which state, uh, you know, it moves from, you know, New York, California, and now it's in Mississippi, Alabama, it still persists throughout whichever states we're talking about. Uh, a report just came out from the CDC this week regarding mental health issues during the COVID pandemic. Uh, again, uh, I'm giving you numbers, and there are a lot of numbers, but they're just shocking numbers. During June, 40% of the 5,000 or so respondents in the survey reported mental health issues including 11% who had considered suicide in the last 30 days. 11%, one out of 10 people. For comparison purposes, the usual rate of having suicidal thoughts in the United States in the last year, 12 months, is about 4%. Young adults in particular had much higher rates than older adults. 75% of those aged 18 to 24 re reported some kind of mental health issues. And a staggering 25%, one out of four, report having thoughts about suicide in the preceding 30 days. And no surprise to us, Black and Latinx reported higher rates of mental distress compared to whites, with twice as many uh, Black and Latinx people reporting suicidal thoughts compared to whites. Um, other things from that survey that I thought was incredibly important to share with you, almost one out of three Americans who had a less than high school education reported suicidal thoughts. And 22% of essential workers did too, although when they did a multivariate analysis, mental health distress was not significantly worse among them compared to other workers. A major new finding that I thought from this study was that unpaid caregivers also had a suicidal thought uh, rate of 30%, and they were three times more likely to have suicidal thoughts or start using substances to cope compared to those who are not unpaid caregivers. So from a disparities perspective, what this says to me is that not only are racial and ethnic minority people dying more from COVID, getting more COVID, dying more from COVID, their family caregivers are actually suffering more as well. And as distressing as this study on mental distress is, I think it's going to get worse. There are reports that up to 30 million Americans, more Americans who become housing insecure due to the economic impact. And I'm now viewing the COVID-19 pandemic as being more than about a single disease caused by a single virus. We are witnessing the beginning of an associate epidemics of mental illness bad outcomes in many other diseases, 
and a terrible, terrible change in the social determinants of health, such as income, employment, and housing. The metaphor that I'm using is that the pandemic is a meteor drop on the earth. And in addition to the direct destruction underneath it, we are also seeing the ripples of shock waves in all health, healthcare system, and just generally society. I'll finish with a little bit about children. Um, there's been some back and forth about children and COVID, an important topic as we consider what to do with schools. Uh, the number of infections among children have been rising. So as of July 30th, there were nearly 340,000 children who had COVID with an infection rate of about 447 per 100,000. A third of those cases were reported just in the last two weeks of July. The states with the worst infection rate among children were Arizona, with almost 1,100 cases per 100,000. South Carolina had 959. Louisiana had 859. Mississippi with almost 800, and Florida with 711. Uh, just FYI, the American Academy of Pediatrics had issued recommendation that children age two and older should wear face covering when they cannot socially distance. There's been some debate about whether or not a three-year-old can actually put a mask on and not put a mask on and keep it on. Uh, there's been some sort of anecdotal evidence that they can. Uh, but the, the American Academy of Pediatrics says that if you're gonna have to let kids back in school, they have to wear a mask. Um, children who get COVID do not get sick as adults, um, but they do get hospitalized uh, at a rate of about eight out of 100,000. And when they do, a third of them end up in the intensive care unit, just like adults. And again, the same story with disparities. Um, racial ethnic disparities for adults have been shown for kids as well. Compared to white infected children, the rate of hospitalization for black infected children was five times higher, and for Latinx children was eight times higher. I'm gonna finish with the one last statement, which is that I think the function of science, which is what I'm here to tell you about, is to guide policy decisions. And, I, and it wouldn't do for me to ignore policy decisions that are contrary to science. So here's my update on our leadership's policies through the lens of science. The children data directly contradicts President Trump's statement that kids are virtually immune to COVID. And if you have attended the prior briefings, I have said over and over again that his statement about the efficacy of hydroxychloroquine is not only contrary to the scientific findings, as a clinician, I think it is malpractice. And then his statements about masks not being helpful in preventing COVID-19 infection is wrong based on scientific findings. 